Hazel. Ecco bene, allora buongiorno a tutti, eh, iniziamo questa terza sessione del convegno intitolata Saperi e linguaggi botanici, come ci dicevamo alcuni momenti fa, possiamo organizzare il nostro lavoro con, eh, ascoltando le prime tre relazioni eh, che sono in lingua inglese, eh, dando eh, agli autori appunto i, i 20 minuti, 25 minuti di tempo Uh, di cui possono avere bisogno, poi facciamo la, la, la discussione, se avremo tempo facciamo anche una breve, una breve pausa, ma con l'idea di ricominciare con gli ultimi due interventi a partire dalle ore 11, in modo tale di finire con calma attorno, attorno alle 12. Se questo, se questo va bene, ok, I'll, I'll switch to English uh, for Justin, ok, so we, we now start with the three uh, papers in English. Uh, you, you all have between 20 minutes, 25 minutes or, or so, and then we, we, uh, uh, we discuss. Uh, there is time for questions and answers. Uh, and then we start again at 11. Okay, so Angel Andreani is our first speaker. Uh, Angel Andreani, uh, well, uh, I am elite a little, uh, in, in a way, I, I don't know how to, 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 to uh, introduce her, uh, since I have known Andreani uh, since she was a student. Uh, she is a colleague, a researcher uh, in, uh, in our department. She teaches uh, English linguistics. Uh, uh, after getting her um, PhD in in uh, Milan, she uh, worked in Turin and she also was a, a Marie Curie uh, fellow uh, in, in England at the University of Sussex. Uh, she uh, has uh, published two, two uh, books uh, focusing on, uh, on uh, um, the, the Elizabethan and, uh, and uh, um, 17th century, 16th, 17th century uh, English uh, English uh, word. Today, her talk is about false cacographies and correct English names, the quest for perfect botanical naming in early modern England. Thank you. Can you all hear me and can you all see the slides? Yeah. Yes, we can. Okay, great. So thank you very much for this introduction. And uh, here I go uh, with this paper in which I will address a specific historical moment in the development of botanical nomenclature in England between the 16th and the 17th centuries, selecting from the, the terminology of the use, use um, in the most important herbals uh, and catalogues of the period. As you can see in the slide, they were all published between the 1540s and the 1640s. And if there is time, I might mention uh, John Ray. Uh, these were all naturalists, uh, with the exception of Henry Light, who was a nobleman and a translator with a passion for plants. Uh, in the Renaissance, as we all know, there was an unprecedented increase in the known plant species. As has been pointed out, it was not only new discoveries that triggered the explosion, but also the desire to describe the vegetal world with care and precision, making ever smaller distinctions between varieties and species. As the number of plants grew, the vocabulary to designate them grew even more. The sources for much of this vocabulary were herbals, a genre which, with ancient roots, but which expanded significantly in modern England. To a certain extent, uh, the nomenclature uh, to designate plants represented a means to establish order in a field, botany, uh, which saw considerable and often chaotic expansion in the early modern period. At the same time, close analysis of some of these terms suggests that explaining the lexical and semantic processes implicit in plant meaning 
can contribute to reveal aspects of the early modern understanding of the natural world. And my journey starts with William Turner. Turner is notable because he had set himself a task uh, that had never really been attempted before, to identify the plants mentioned in the classical treatises and to provide them with their corresponding English names. Uh, he is credited as the earliest scholarly link between British and continental botany, and he traveled extensively through Germany, Switzerland and Italy, where he came in contact with the most important European natural historians of the time. He obtained an MD from the University of Bologna Ferrara, and uh, his herbals, all published between the 1530s and the 1560s, bear evidence of what has been uh, termed a lifelong wrestling with the problems of attaching the right Latin and English names to plants. In the preface of his magnum opus, the herbal, Turner had in fact famously complained about the state of botany in England, uh, especially targeting popular compilations which he deemed all full of unlearned cacographies and falsely naming of herbs. Turner was not alone in his concerns uh, over the correct naming of plants. In fact, before the binomial nomenclature began to be applied as the method to designate plants and animals universally, early modern naturalists across Europe experimented extensively. Uh, but what made uh, names false or cartographies and what counted as a correct name at this stage in botanical learning? Uh, to answer this question, let's start from an example drawn from Turner. So this is a map of Lombardy, more or less, or the uh, Bassa Padana. Uh, uh, in the early 1540s, uh, William Turner is traveling up the Po Valley, uh, where uh, coming from Ferrara, going up towards Como, where for the first time in his life, he apparently saw a great plenty of white poplars, by the riverside, where he noted they were called alber. He remarked that he had not seen them in any place in England, but should this tree be found there, it may be called a white ash or a white poplar, because the underside of the leaf is white as any paper. He provided a name and an explanation for it. The name derived from an observable physical characteristic of the plant. And Turner further remarked uh, that um, in England, uh, the populace is called uh, with many names. Some call it poplar and others call it asp or an asp tree. But not every tree in England called poplar or asp is the right populus neither. And he attempted to clarify this situation by differentiating species based on the different habitats in which they could be found. Already from these comments, we can see that some of the problems connected with vegetal nomenclature in this period, which is uh, plants with no names and plants with too many names. We can explore this question further in diachronic perspective, and to this end, I will concentrate on the naming of another plant introduced by Turner and its later developments. This is uh, Kuniza. In 1548, Turner writes, Kuniza is of two sorts, the greater and the less, have seen both the kinds in Italy between Cremona and Ferrara by the Padus Bank, and Kuniza may be called in English Fleabane. So uh, the term Kuniza is alone from Greek uh, through Latin, perhaps. The meaning is obscure, but it has been connected with the acrid smell uh, originating from the, uh, uh, from the dust, uh, which um, originates from the um, uh, essicated plant. Um, but it has also been connected with the Greek uh, knopos, meaning flea or mosquito. At any rate, today it designates a genus of plants that comes from the Americas. So it is more likely that Turner, what Turner saw were species of Erigeron or Pulicaria. And I thank uh, Ilda Vaggio very much for helping me out with this identification. Uh, the family is that of the Asteraceae, which is known in England as the Aster Daisy or Sunflower family. And what I want to point out here is that uh, 
This is one of the largest families with thousands of known species and genera. So if we go back to Turner, who only listed two sorts of Coniza, we see that we are in the ancient history of the identification of this plant. And I will keep on referring to it as Coniza, uh, even though this term may be wrong by modern standards, because this is the way that we find in our sources. But again, we're probably talking about the region or Pulicaria or varieties of them. In English, uh, the term fleabane, coined by Turner, is still used as a name for various plants. We have tall fleabane, blue fleabane, etc. This is a compound of flea and bane, and compounding, it must be noted, is a very productive strategy in the field of botany. And bane uh, is a recurrent term in plant names. So this word means poison, slayer, and as can be expected, it is found in the names of plants which are toxic or are in some way harmful to people or animals. Other plant names of this kind in English are leopard's bane and wolf's bane, and the, as the etymology reveals, uh, they are often carps or uh, loan translations. They are interesting as exocentric compounds in that the determinatum, or in other words, the plant, remains outside the combination. Uh, it is not called flea herb, but flea bane. And we can also see, we can also note that the name does not really define any particular characteristic or feature of the plant, uh, physical feature, I mean, but rather the plant takes its name after one of its properties, effects or functions. Morphologically, some of these coinages are genetic compounds, but semantically, uh, the relationship between the two nouns may be understood as uh, N2 for N1, as you see on the slide, so poison for fleas. And in fact, as one of our herbalists makes clear regarding the name of this plant, in English it is called flea bane because being burnt or laid in chambers, it will kill gnats, fleas or serpents. So, um, this is one of the models uh, available for naming plants uh, in early modern England, and other analogous coinages by Turner are uh, heel dog, with, to heal dog from uh, dog bites, or parthenium used in childbirth, and this type of naming underscores a utilitarian conception of the vegetal world, indicating that what is uh, highlighted is the uses and values of plants for people. But we have another model available, that of descriptive names, which we have seen in the case of white hasp. And other examples are cotton thistle, defined because it is covered with cotton down, bindweed, um, which defines their growth as a climbing species and translates the Latin from vogulus, and so on. One, um, one further aspect that highlights Turner's concern with naming is that his herbals are arranged uh, alphabetically. So there appears to be no intention to classify plants based on their characteristics, habitats or uses. The arrangement is completely artificial, in contrast with later naturalists, as we will see shortly. So back to our case. Uh, interestingly, uh, 20 years later, Turner changed his mind and proposed that, that this plant may be called in English Kniza, so he dropped fleabane. Whatever Turner's misgivings about fleabane, they were not shared by Henry Light, who retained the term in his 1578 translation um, of the important herbal by Dodoens. Before the end of the century, however, another famous herbalist, John Gerard, challenged the name of this plant and he wrote, Kniza from time to time has been called in English fleabane, but without reason, considering there is another herb so called. But if it were possible to root out ancient errors, I would gladly have Kniza to be called in English fleabane mullet to make a difference between two herbs that bear one name. Like Turner, Gerard showed a special care about names, and this passage exposes the problem of plant identification when the same name is attributed to different plants, thereby producing a situation of multiple reference. 
Evidently, he was worried about a potential confusion. However, the fact that he retained Turner's neologism, Fleabane, despite his reservations, clearly indicates that Fleabane was becoming the established name for this plant at this time. Still, Gerard separated two herbs, often confused, according to him, and the other plant, uh, he explained, is named in English fleawort, not because it kills fleas, but because the seeds are like fleas in proportion, colors, and dimension. And therefore, those who call this plant fleabane are wrong. Uh, and he further wrote, some hold that the herbs trod in the chamber where many fleas be will drive them away, for which cause it took the name fleawort. But I think this is rather because the seed does resemble a flea so much that it is hard to discern the one from the other. Here, Gerard offers an etymological explanation to resolve a misidentification that has become embedded in language, in names. It is not a bane for fleas, but rather the semantic relationship is metaphoric extension. The transfer of the lexeme flea onto the vegetal world is based on similarity in shape and size. This explanation of the naming of the plant is meant to clarify matters concerning uh, the correct use of the plant. What is underscored here is that an error in names results in an error in use and vice versa. We can see that there are, um, we can see here that the correct name functions as a sort of uh, instruction to the correct usage of the plant, if this is understood properly. And if different plants distinguish, sorry, if different names distinguish different plants, uh, Gerard has also different entries for fleabane, canisa, and fleabane, uh, uh, fle sorry, fleawort, psyllium. Here they are. Different names designate different herbs, whereas different varieties of the same herb are labeled creating further compounds adding one or more modifiers to the name. We have a system which resembles a binary one, though this is not systematic and there are some contradictions. What this example illustrates, however, is an additional function of, name, of naming in the botanical world, which is uh, used to classify. Since I have mentioned Turner's arrangement, it might be worth uh, noting that Jared's herbal is organized into books reflecting the general uh, division of plants into arbor, frutex, sufrutex, and herba, which is the traditional groups identified by Theophrast who still in use at this stage. Um, this is differently from the, uh, different from the alphabetical artificial arrangement by Turner and more uh, similar to a natural system, which will also be the case with uh, Jerk's successors. Uh, so continuing down our timeline, uh, the world of Coniza uh, becomes more and more crowded. Uh, in John Johnson's edition of Jared's Herbal, 1633, um, well, this edition has many changes uh, compared to, to, to the edition of 1597, and it aptly illustrates the explosion uh, I referred to in the introduction. We have 10 different sorts of Coniza or Fleabane here. Johnson abandoned the distinction between flea word and flea bane introduced by Jarrett, and his complex nomenclature reflects a classification of vari uh, varieties based on multiple criteria such as size, uh, physical characteristics, uh, habitat or provenance, color, and other features such as hairiness. Also, we can see that the Latin nomenclature is not always translated uh, into English. I want to zoom in uh, the third species of fleabane catalogued by Johnson because this is particularly interesting. And this is Coniza media, which some have referred unto as the mint. Here we have an explicit reference to the fact that the name provides an indication of the genus of a plant. So mints are one genus and conizas are another. Of particular value for language historians, then, is um, the evidence we find in this entry of dialectal and social professional variation. Uh, Johnson records that in Cheapside, the herb women call it the herb, herb Christopher and send it to the empress, who with it, as they say, 
uh, he's hedging here, make medicines for the eyes, but against what effect of them or what success, I know not. Uh, he sounds very skeptical. And this is not the only example of a name used by herb women I have found in the herbals, which, suge which suggests that the recording of this alternative nomenclature was something of a habit for herbalists, often done with polemical intent. As this example makes clear, in fact, women healers and empirics were identified as a different community using and naming herbs in an unlearned, approximate and often wrong way. Less than 10 years after Johnson, we have the publication of the Theatrum Botanicum by John Parkinson, uh, who added the new discoveries by other European naturalists. Parkinson returned to a distinction between fleabane and fleawort and, uh, um, as different herbs, and within them he found further specifications. Uh, as we can see, the nomenclature chosen by Parkinson was also based on characteristics of the plant, with some exceptions, as we see in number one, nine, and ten, uh, which are varieties named after their discoverers, and interestingly, again, not translated into English. Concerning the names based on characteristics of the plant, we can see that size is a feature, so we have small and great, in alternative R in combination with color, hairiness, location, and then we have a significant addition here, which is smell, uh, not present in previous nomenclature. These differences may reflect the broader debate in the field of botany concerning the classification of plants and regarding which structures uh, constitute their defining characteristics, whether smell, color, location, reproductive apparatus or something else very different. What, hap what had happened in the, in the world of botany in the meanwhile uh, was the publication of Balkin's Pinax, a very uh, botanic, a very influential um, uh, botanical compilation, and also Cesalpinos the Plantis, who had debunked the traditional division into plants inherited from the classics. So now, uh, since my time is almost over, I will skip John Ray and jump back to my initial question uh, drawing towards a conclusion. So this is the chronology of the names attributed to Fleabane, Kuniza and varieties I have found in my sources. And uh, the example of Kuniza, I think, shows various aspects connected with the idea of perfect or correct naming in the vegetable world. In summary, we have seen that compounds could lead to grouping plants together based on misunderstandings that became embedded in language. And this is precisely what happened through the history of Kunaiza and Fleabane, and what the development of different principles of naming and classification by later botanists would be trying to avoid. Uh, through this period, we see that naming is a shift from an instrument of knowledge of the behavior of properties and uses of plants to a tool to make sense of an expanding and increasingly complex world. For instance, um, as one reads them, one realizes that these compilations uh, are not just catalogs of the known plant species, um, but they also worked as a catalog or reference tools of scholarly terminology. For instance, in the example on the slide, we have um, reference to the fact that a certain variety of Kuniza had been called in a certain way by other uh, herbalists, by other naturalists. Um, to conclude, uh, the uh, notion of correctness in naming is complex and shifting and has multiple dimensions. It has a utilitarian dimension, which has to do with the correct understanding of the properties of a plant and hence its use. And we can't forget that uh, from a practical point of view, plants were the main source for medical preparations and uh, one paramount concern was to identify them correctly in order to use them in the right way. We can recall Jared's polemic over flea words or flea bane, and also the polemic against the herb women. And then there is a descriptive dimension, uh, which has to do with the observation of the characteristics of a plant available as a model since Turner. But we see that in later compilations, uh, the concerns with the development of a viable system to identify different varieties within the same groupings, uh, groupings become more pressing. 
we are far from the systematic application of binary nomenclature and even further from the binomial system, of course. Yet the nomenclature seems to suggest that this is the direction towards which we're moving. Uh, these two dimensions still exist throughout our period and naturalists resorted to one or the other alternatively, oscillating between anthropocentric views of the vegetal world in which what matters is the value to, of plants to humans and the natural principle more attentive to observing plants in their own body. And here I and thank you very much. Okay, uh, okay, uh, thank you, Angela. Um, a very interesting uh, case study uh, of, um, well, uh, I, I expected something different, but you, you, you focus on a very specific case study, um, which in, in a way um, made us aware that the uh, problem of identification is the, the key problem. Uh, of course, ambiguity in terminology is what is wrong, um, uh, but but it, it evidently uh, you 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 show that it took time. Um, any, anyway, we will we will discuss that. Uh, I, I was also uh, in a way uh, surprised by by what uh, you uh, you uh, told us uh, because I had interpreted uh, cacographies in, in your title and in your references uh, in in uh, meaning meaning the opposite of orthography, so problem of spelling. So it was not, a, as a matter of fact, a problem of spelling. It was a problem of, of choice of different lexical options, uh, which, which, is, which was well done. Anyway, uh, th thank you. Uh, we can move on to the second, of course, more on during discussion time. Uh, we move on to Justin Begley, uh, who earned a doctorate in Oxford. Uh, with the a dissertation on the poet Margaret Cavendish, a very peculiar uh, uh, woman in uh, in a way, a poet, a playwright, and and uh, a scientist or natural natural uh, philosopher. Uh, if I, uh, as far as I could see, uh, uh, Justin then moved away between uh, between um, Finland. Uh, Helsinki and, and now working uh, at the Herzog August Bibliothek in Wotenbüttel. Um, his research focuses on early modern intellectual history, uh, history of science, uh, and, and specifically, and uh, very interestingly, this idea of uh, uh, um, ideas about plants and animals and the interrelationship between between the two, huh? uh, so I'm 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 very keen on on listening to your talk. Um, uh, Justin's talk uh, is entitled uh, "Nehemiah Grew and Stephen Hales on the Uses and Abuses of Plant-Animal Analogies." Okay, up to you. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not based in Italian and my Italian is very weak. I will try to improve that in the future, but <laughs> I, I wanted to apologize to, to everyone. Um, can, can you see my PowerPoint? Yeah, we do. Okay, good, good. Okay, so while their names are little known today, Nehemiah Grew and Stephen Hales were two of the most important and influential early modern botanists. Grew's groundbreaking botanical publication the 1682 Anatomy of Plants, was based on lectures that he delivered before the Royal Society of London, while Hales's Vegetable Statics, which is probably the most significant work of experimental botany from the 18th century, appeared almost 50 years later, in 1727. In his classic 1913, Makers of British Botany, F.W. Oliver set the tone for subsequent studies of Hales, of which there are actually very few, when he wrote that Hales was a solitary figure and that the works in Grew and his Italian contemporary, Marcello Mapigi, were known to Hales, but they do not appear to have influenced them. In particular, Oliver argues that it was because Mapigi's and Grew's output was so dependent on the an na analogical rather than on ascertained facts that it influenced Hales so little. As this suggests, Grew developed a method 
method, whereby he drew analogies between plant and animal functions. Most famously, he was the first to propose that plants like animals reproduce sexually, with pollen corresponding to sperm. And he was the first to generate a sophisticated model of respiration, with roots acting as melts that suck up air. It is partly because Hales is best known for overturning an analogy, namely that sap circulates like blood, that it has been supposed that he found nothing of value in Grew. But we will see in this talk that one, Hales did not oppose the analogical method as such, and two, Grew had also challenged the analogy between the circulation of sap and blood, and may even have inspired Hales in this regard. Okay. So rather than situating Hales in relation to his botanical contemporaries, he has been framed as a quantitative Newtonian who viewed natural bodies through a reductionist lens. One study has indeed gone so far as to claim that Hales' challenge to the circulation of sap resulted from his reading of Isaac Newton's opening sentence of the optics, published in 1704, which implied that the work is admirably free from conjecture, analogy, metaphor, or hyperbole. It is true that Hale was more quantitatively orientated than Grew, but I will argue that Hale's quantitative method was less similar to those of Newton than to those of James Keel in the long-standing tradition of quantitative medicine to which Keel contributed. At the same time, regarding the claim that Hale's rejected the analogical, the extent historiography is in general tends to suppose that empiricist and quantitative spirit supplanted the more qualitative approaches that reigned in previous centuries. Lakoff and Johnson perhaps best summed the sentiment up when they claimed in their influential study, Metaphors We Live By, that with the rise of empirical science as a model for truth in the 17th and 18th centuries, suspicion of poetry and rhetoric became dominant in Western thought, with metaphor and other figurative devices such as analogy becoming objects of scorn. But we will see that Hales by no means supplanted an analogical method with an empirical, mathematical and broadly Newtonian one. Rather, he used mathematics as a tool as he grappled with and tested various analogies, rejected some, and accepted others. He accordingly supposed that quantitative and analogical methods could both be powerful tools in the course of coming to terms with the nature of plant life. So to understand Hale's plant physiology, and in particular, how he dealt with the problem of analogy across natural kingdoms, I will look first at how Hale's read grew, and then turn to how he used Keel's method to bolster experimentally the specific disanalogy between the circulation of sap and blood. So it is a little odd that no study has yet paired Grew and Hales, since Hales acknowledges his debt to Grew at intervals in vegetable statics, including at the beginning of his pre preface. Here he writes that Grew and Malpighi were the first who, nearly at the same time, unknown to each other, engaged in a very diligent and thorough inquiry into the structure and vessels of plants. Hales proceeded to log Grew and Malpighi for passing down very accurate and faithful accounts of the structure of the parts of plants, which they carefully traced from their first minute origins, the seminal plant, to their full growth and maturity, in all which they observed an exact and regular symmetry of parts most curiously wrought in such manner that the great work of vegetation might effectively be carried out. As this indicates, what Hales most admired about Grew was his accurate investigation of plant structures, that is to say, plant anatomy. In contrast to Grew's anatomical mapping, Hales supposed that Grew's physiological explanations of plant functions were wanting, partly because he rarely conducted experiments or took the quantitative into consideration. Un like Grew, Hales outlined his experiments in great details and even presented experimental results from which he could not generate certain conclusions. Even so, Hales' juxtaposition of his experimental method with Grew's analogical one should not lead us to concur with prior scholars that the observational and experimental were in fundamental tension with the analogical. On the contrary, observations are what allow Grew to generate his analogies as much as his analogies allowed him to observe certain structures within plants. And these observations, in turn, functions as a basis for Hale, who could devise quantitative experiments to test particular claims. In addition to admiring Grew's anatomical findings, Hale accepted his contention that there is strong correspondence between certain plant and animal parts, and that this is the reason why he had faith in applying to plants a quantitative model of analysis that had previously been used to study animal bodies. 
both, and you can see on the his study, Hale started with the study of animal bodies, and you can see him here measuring the, the blood pressure from a horse. So both Grew and Hales indeed began by studying um, animal anatomy and physiology before they turned to plants. As Hales put it in relation to the study of the motion of fluids, by the same quantitative method of inquiry, considerable discoveries may in time be made, there being in many respects a great analogy between plants and animals. Hales also maintained that that in vegetables, their growth and the preservation of their vegetable life is promoted and maintained as in animals by the very plentiful and regular motion of their fluid. This emphasis on the shared fluids in plants and animals and the regular motions is significant because it shows how subtly Hales departed from the near consensus that sap circulated in plants as blood does in animals, a consensus that, as noted at the outset, grew was the first to challenge seriously. In terms of this consensus, um, the hypothesis that sap circulates was first proposed by Johann Daniel Mayor in his 1665 Dissertatio Botanica. And he was building on William Harvey's work, and, then, and this, his work was then developed by prominent early Royal Society members, including John Beale, John Ray, and Francis Willoughby. So while the next section looks at the experiment that allowed Hales to challenge robustly this consensus, it is worth considering the mechanisms that he pulled here and how this relates to Gru's thinking. According to Hales, rather than circulating, sap is carried to great heights by the vigorous undulations of the sun's warmth, which may reciprocally cause vibrations in the ves vesicles and sap vessels and thereby, make them, and thereby make them dilate and contract. Hales' idea then was that the sun stimulates the vibrations of sap vessels and that this pushes it upwards. Hales was forced to draw this conclusion because he recognized that vegetables, which are inanimate, have not an engine which, by its alternate dilation and contraction, does in animals forcibly drive the blood through the arteries and veins, I, namely the heart. While he doesn't acknowledge it, Hales was riding, Hales was riding on Gru's coattails with this suggestion. As Anne-Marie Russe has shown, Gru began to question the notion that sap circulated as early as 1672, perhaps as a result of a request from the Royal Society to investigate the issue. In doing so, Grew demonstrated that while the bleeding of plants could be possibly due to the internal pressure forcing the plants to yield its sap when, when cut, the circulation of the sap in plants was not the same as it was in animals, with there being no valves in plants as in animals and no equivalent to a heart. As this suggests, Grew also held that sap ascends and moving upwards and outwards from the roots, gradually suffuses inertia is every portion of every part of the plant, taking different forms as it infuses the vessels and fibers. It is these volatizing vessels that, for Gru and Hales, allowed the sap to move upwards without the advantage of pulsation. Both Gru and Hales held, in short, that the return of the sap was highly improbable on a structural level, since they both considered sap to be generated in the roots and to perspire through the leaves, and this perspiration would not leave very much fluid to return down to the roots. So there are two takeaway, major takeaway points here. Um, and we can see also in this PowerPoint that these bleeding vessels in the plants. But we have, so I have two, two, two major takeaway points um, to refer to here. The first is that Hales was not fundamentally opposed to Gru's analogical method and indeed re uh, reiterated from an an, um, that an analogical method could lead to great advantages in botany. The second is that Gru rejected the analogy between the circulation of blood and sap, and that Hales was famous for experimentally overturning this. With Gru being a selective rather than a naive analogist, and with Hales being a careful reader of Gru, might Hales not have taken Gru's skepticism towards the circulation of sap as a launchpad for his own experimental investigations in the subject? i.e. he built on Gru's analogical and disanalogical method in constructing his experiments. And with that, we can turn to um, Hale's experiment. So, so far I've suggested that Hale's, is, that Hales admired Gru's anatomical research, but took seriously um, and took seriously his analogical method and accepted one of his striking anti-analogical conclusions. I've also no noted that Hales considered Gru's physiological explanations to be indecisive, partly because Gru did not tend to experiment. However, there was another important reason why Hales found Gru's method insufficient, and this was, to use Hales' words, 
because he had not deployed a statical way of inquiry. The term statics was introduced in the 18th century to refer to the science dealing with weights and its mechanical effects, and with the conditions of equilibrium resulting from the distribution of weight. It was by making use of this method that Hales hoped to set his work apart from that of prior botanists. As a divine, Hales confidently introduced his statical approach with the argument that, since we are sure that the all-wise creator has observed the most exact proportion of number, weight, and measure in the making of all things, the most likely way, therefore, to get an insight into the nature of those parts of the creation which come within our observation must in all reason be by number, uh, weight, and measure, to number, weight, and measure. Putting a theological spin on Grew's notion of a structural symmetry between plants and animals, Hales thus um, set out to apply a statical method which had previously been confined to humans, to plants. Now, I mentioned at the outset that as a quantitatively orientated experimentalist, Hales has regularly been dubbed a Newtonian. And in fact, um, his Vegetable Statics was the last book to receive uh, Newton's imprimatur before his death, and he appropriately lauded Newton in the preface. But Hales only cites Newton once in his discussion of vegetables and the motion of sap. Much more so than Newton, it was the physician James Keel who inspired Hale's statical approach. Keel's main contribution, his 1718 Medicina Statica Britannica, focused almost exclusively on human ingestion and excretion, but Hales realized that he could analogically apply it, uh, its method to a largely imperceptible working of vegetables. As Hales put it, when it comes to the uh, um, discoveries that have been made in the animal economy, we shall find the most considerable and rational count of it have been chiefly owing to the statical examination of their fluids, that is, by inquiring what quantity of fluids and solids dissolved into fluids the animal daily takes in for its support and nourishment. By transferring Keel's method to the fluid intake and excretion um, to vegetables, Hales could establish once and for all whether or not sap circulated. Hale saw two possibilities when he looked at plants in relation to animals. The first was that they ingest and excrete roughly the same amount of fluid, meaning that their economies must be similar. The second was that they ingest and excrete dissimilar amounts, in which case it would be necessary to search for structural and functional dissimilarities. To determine which was most probable, Hales commenced an experiment in July 1724, choosing a large sunflower as his model. Um, in doing so, he covered the pot containing the sunflower with a plate and cemented the gap so that no vapors could escape, but only air through a small glass tube that was fixed near the stem of the plant. Through another tube, he watered the plant and stopped it with a cork when it was not in use. Hills weighed the pot and plant for 15 days straight and then discovered that the plant perspired on average one pound four ounces worth of liquid. He then measured the leaves to determine the size of the surface area through which the plant could perspire, which he compared with the surface area of the skin on a well-sized man, as measured by Keel. What Hales discovered was that the leaves took up far more of a plant's body than the skin did of a human's, which he accounted for by the fact that the kidney absorbs nearly half of human fluid, rather than it being pers perspired through the skin. Hales accordingly ventured that it was because plants lack an organ akin to the kidney that the leaves have a greater surface area to allow for a large provision for a plentiful perspiration in the plants. This was all very well, but Hale's more ambitious goal was to determine the velocity and directionality of the sap as related to that of blood. Ultimately, Hale's worked out that the perspiration of a sunflower is as 141 to 100, and taking size into account in equal surfaces in equal times, the man perspires as 50 to 15. Hales accounted for the excess perspiration in humans quite traditionally, with reference to the fact that human bodies are much hotter than the surrounding air, unlike plants, which are roughly air temperature. Once these differences in, a bo in body heat are taken into consideration, Hale stressed that the perspiration of plants and animals broadly corresponds. And using Keel's results, he calculated that this meant the plant imbibed 17 times more fresh food than the man. So where did all this lead Hales? Well, having worked out that plants ingest more food per unit of perspiring surface area than humans, 
Hales determined that the pressure that the sap must exert on the plant system via vessels would be almost five times higher than the blood pressure in a dog. As he wrote, the motion of the sap is thereby much accelerated, which in the heartless vegetable would otherwise be very slow, it having probably only a progressive and not a circulating motion as in animals. Whereas the fourth full diastole of the heart pushes blood quickly around animal bodies, in plants it is the large quantity of sap that allows for the same movement. As Hales put it, if it were less sap or, or less perspiration, the sap must necessarily stagnate, notwithstanding the sap vessels are so curiously adapted by their excessive fineness to raise the sap to great heights in a reciprocal proportion to their very minute diameter. The insight about sap circulation, we should note, fitted into Hale's broader understanding of air, which he, did, which he discovered became stale when recycled through the body. And um, we might also note that he was the first inventor of the uh, ventilator, and that was partly, he partly came to this idea through his measurement of plant respiration as well as animal. So having firmed up Gru's hypothesis that perspiration occurs through the leaves as sap is moved it moves up in a plant through slender vessels, Hales could announce his boldest anti-analogical conclusion, the sap, unlike blood, only ascends. However, we should bear in mind that this realization was entirely dependent on the analogical finding that plants via leaves and humans via skin perspire in much the same way. As Hales put it, that the perspiring matter of trees is rather actuated by warmth and so exalted than protruded by the force of the sap upwards, also holds true in animals, for the, perspiration, for the perspiration in them is not always greatest in the greatest force of the blood, but then often least of all, as in fevers. Uh, even as Hales denied that sap circulates like blood, he was happy to compare the processes of perspiration in plants and animals, and even to venture that they had the same material cause, namely heat. In carrying out a range of sophisticated Keelian experiments, Hales ultimately let quantitative rigor to Gru's model of analogical and disanalogical thinking. Hale's insight has several broader implications for the scale of nature that are worth touching on before drawing to a close. In essence, his argument for sap ascent rested on the realization that the earth is a plentiful supplier and that there was accordingly no need for plant sap to return to the roots whence it came. Indeed, like Gru, Hales meant Pain, that it would have been an inefficiency in nature if sap descended when plants like a heart-like function that would have endowed them the dow the sap with renewed vitality. For Gru, Hales, and the majority of early modern naturalists, God had designed everything in nature to execute perfectly its intended end. The implication, however, was that the system of fluids in animals was inefficient, though Hales was aware that animals paid this price for their mobility. The fact that sap only moved in one direction was, as Hales recognized, both a disadvantage for plants in that it rendered them fixed beings, but also a great asset, perfectly suiting them to their immediate environments and making them uniquely economical. So now, now I'll conclude. Hales, we have seen, employed qualitative analogical thinking insofar as he recognized that the nutritive functions of plants and animals are sufficiently similar to allow for comparison. But based on his basic acceptance of the idea that plants and animals share nutritive processes, have comparative systems of fluid, and perspire similarly, we have also seen that he employed a quantitative analysis in, su in uh, such a way as to bolster Gru's disanalogical notion that plants that moves unidirectionally, unlike blood and animals. In disproving one of the hy principal hypotheses of contemporary plant anatomists, Hales threatened to disrepute the analogical method, but since he still deemed sap and blood to be analogous enough to warrant a quantitative comparison, might we also say that it was only through the careful consideration of analogies that Gru was able to cast doubt on the utility of this specific analogy. We have also seen that Hales did not so much rely upon Newton as on Keel, and thus a long history of quantitative medicine that emphasized balance and found its fullest expression in the Italian physician, Santorio Santorio. It is telling in this regard that John Quincy attached Dr. Keel's Medicina Statica Britannica in a 1720 edition of his translation of Santorio 1614 de Statica Medicina, in which he observes that the main 
point of difference between the two texts is that the authors lived and worked in different climates, i.e. they were very similar methods except for the different climates. Given Keel's debts to Centorio and Hales to Keel, might it also be said that rather than pigeonholing Keels as a Newtonian, we are better off viewing him as a botanist who spliced the qualitative analogies long typical of comparative physiology as pioneered by Gru, with a venerable tradition of quantitative medicine that hark back to Galen. And that is that is all from me. Thank you. Uh, OK, th th thank you, Justin. Um, very interesting talk. Uh, I, I, well, personally, I, I knew nothing about this. Um, what, what, what you, what you said in, in a way, I, I'm, I'm sure you're wrong, but this r reminded me some, somehow of the medieval chain of being: God, angel, man, animal, plants, and, and so on and so forth. I, I, I don't know, but we, we will discuss about that uh, in, 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 in due time after Elisabetta Lonati's. Uh, paper. Uh, Elisabetta is an associate professor of English at the University of Piemonte Orientale, Eastern Piedmont, uh, has long been working on uh, uh, English lexicography and, uh, um, and lexicology, especially working on, also working on, on uh, uh, early English uh, encyclopedias. Uh, her uh, title today and and, uh, and another field of research uh, is uh, the history of medical English and medical terminology okay so here again uh, we we are um, uh, as as in previous uh, talks uh, in, in between uh, uh, Latin as the language of science and uh, and uh, uh, the vernacular languages of uh, early modern uh, Europe your talk today is entitled New Plants and New Names, Botanical Terminology in Late Modern English Lexicography. OK, thank you. Thank you. Uh, can you see my slide? Yes, we do. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, the general issue of this discussion today is uh, these new plants and new names, uh, where do they uh, 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 come from? Um, and I would start from um, a quotation taken from a new dictionary of trade and commerce by uh, Rowlt, published in London in 1756. Uh, a subhead word of wood is in wood in geography uh, as a multitude of, of trees extended over a large tract of land and propagated without culture and can you see me and listen to yeah, can yeah. You hear? yes okay without uh, culture culture as tillage but then culture as the devotion and special attention or study um, uh, to the development of an activity uh, came. And uh, so many plants and their respective names coming from Cape Verde, Ceylon, uh, Molucca Island, Brazil, Madagascar, Numidia, and uh, many other countries just uh, were included uh, into uh, uh, lexicographic works. This is an interesting uh, entry because it displays the um, colonial expansion, British colonial expansion at the time, uh, and uh, the relevance of uh, trade and commerce and uh, the knowledge of new plants that were used in many different uh, emerging uh, disciplinary uh, domains, medicine and botany uh, are two of them. Um, the sources. The sources are for uh, lexicographic uh, medic, um, and works, medical dictionaries, uh, well-known dictionaries at the time, uh, two folio uh, dictionaries, James, uh, a medicinal dictionary, and Mother B, a new medicinal dictionary. They were published in the 40s, at the very start, and then Mother B's uh, dictionary 30 years uh, later, and two, let's say, portable dictionaries. Barrow, Dictionario Medico Universale, and Hooper, a compendious medical dictionary. Uh, so uh, these 
sources may be subdivided uh, into uh, ropes, which are the main features uh, uh, relevant for uh, the study. Uh, the folio uh, dictionaries were inclusive, are inclusive, comprehensive works, and for an educated expert or non-expert uh, uh, readership, that's prestigious and expensive. So for uh, wealthy uh, uh, people, upper middle classes or um, upper classes, and in particular, James is characterized by its scholarly uh, perspective. So trying to include uh, what was known at the time about medicine, uh, medicine as a vast uh, area of knowledge, so including many other uh, branches or uh, sub-branches. Um, and to um, instead uh, smaller dictionaries in size and including uh, a more, more limited number of entries. Uh, these are Barrows, uh, an octavo volume, and um, Hooper, uh, Duodecimo uh, volume. They were affordable works, less expensive for semi expert uh, or practitioners. Uh, or uh, students, for example, and they uh, have and they display very practical um, uh, issues. Um, this is extremely important because we'll see later how some features are shared, uh, notwithstanding these differences in size. Um, the specific aim of this study is to uh, analyze, to investigate botanical terminology from the 1740s to the end of the century um, in relation to the degree of inclusion in medical dictionaries and lexicalization processes, which means uh, spelling variants and their uh, preference as uh, to lexicalize uh, these new plans, so and, and the use of equivalents, the role of equivalents, and uh, the language used to um, arrange to include these terms uh, in this dictionary. So Latin or Latinate words versus English or Anglicized words, and also other languages, but uh, transliterated, um, uh, transliterated uh, uh, names but also uh, lexicographic and their encyclopedic treatment. And this is a more, uh, let's say, uh, qualitative uh, issue. So the structure of the entry, of the entry uh, and, um, uh, and uh, its components. So the head word, spelling variants, labels if present, etymology, uh, equivalence, definition, the expansion encyclopedic expansion and cross-references or external references as well, the semantic or pragmatic load. So uh, that load provided by definition and uh, encyclopedic load uh, provided by these expansions, descriptions or um, uh, more, um, uh, more detailed uh, issues. Mm. Um, as regards this, uh, uh, I mean, botanical terminology, uh, in this study, um, I mean, we include medicine. Uh, so it refers, it traces back to medicine, uh, which is a very, um, a very uh, broad. Uh, um, domain at the time, uh, not so specialized as nowadays we uh, we uh, perceive and we know our uh, aid. Uh, pharmacy, including pharmacy or uh, botanical plants used mm, uh, to uh, prepare mm, uh, cures, medicines. Uh, medicinal plants in general used as such, so with particular uh, medical uses, but known as simple, so without any particular uh, uh, preparation, and also food, and in particular those aromatic uh, plants that uh, were found around the world. 
to start, um, to start with a discussion, it's uh, relevant to have a look uh, at the uh, title pages. This is Jane's title page. The title page, botany is included. Uh, these are the major uh, domains included in this medicinal dictionary. Botany is included. And uh, uh, it is associated, as chemistry is associated to the history of drugs mm, and also the preparations, combinations and uses. You can see this is the first page. It is a very, very dense folio of pages. The, um, the medicinal dictionaries, uh, medic mm, the medicinal dictionary is um, uh, in uh, three uh, in, fol uh, in folio uh, volume. So very, very uh, dense and uh, detailed, but just a handful of, um, of entries. Mm. Uh, this is instead the other folio dictionary, a medical dictionary. In this case, we haven't uh, the word uh, botany, but uh, something that was used to uh, highlight uh, the relevance of uh, cures and, uh, and preparations, materia medica or pharmacy. Uh, materia medica obviously includes mm, um, uh, um, uh, research uh, and preparations based on uh, plants. Again, this is the first uh, page, again, dense, clearly dense, but uh, more entries are included. And this is another uh, interesting aspect, just one uh, volume for Mother B. And now we skip to uh, the smaller uh, dictionaries. Um, again, botany uh, comes back. We are at the end of the 40s. And um, this is, and, and pharmacy mm, uh, is included. As you can see, it's um, very, very similar to Jane's uh, dictionary. So the same uh, domains with the addition of pharmacy. Uh, why is these, uh, um, this similarity uh, relevant? Because actually, Barrow, even though we are dealing with a single volume, an octavo volume, uh, um, I mean, Barrow's Limata uh, um, overlaps as uh, regards botany with Jane's uh, Limata. It's very, very uh, similar, but you can see the difference. So, very concise entries, uh, limited in the uh, uh, details that they include uh, the ingredients, uh, the elements they include, but we are dealing with a portable uh, dictionary uh, with very practical aims. Uh, um, Barrow wasn't a uh, um, uh, uh, physician, but a chemist. Mm, so this is relevant. Chemistry is relevant. All of this uh, is related. And the, uh, uh, the last dictionary, um, Duodecimo single volume, again, Materia Medica comes back, pharmacy uh, disappears, botany uh, not included here, but chemistry. So again, so the relationship, the network uh, between these emerging and self-defining uh, in progress uh, uh, disciplinary domains. Another uh, layout, and these, is similar to um, it is similar to uh, the layout of handbooks, mm. uh, but in any way arranged in um, alphabetical order. Mm. Now, uh, just to have a look here uh, to, to mark uh, uh, the difference in numbers, uh, I focused on uh, five letters at the very start of. Um, uh, the dictionaries at the end of them and midway. Why? This is a lexicographic technique to analyze uh, dictionaries because actually at the very start compilers tend to expand uh, letters and this is the case. The first volume uh, of James Dictionary counts 741 pages uh, for uh, letter A out of 958. Things are different. Uh, 
McWay and uh, uh, and different for P, even though obviously A and P include uh, more words uh, uh, of medical, uh, um, I mean, related to and belonging to the medical domain. So, but in any in any case, uh, things are clear. More balanced the situation for Barrow and Hooper. Just to have a look at this. So we're dealing with very different sources, but uh, there are many similarities. Now we focus on uh, the qualitative. Um, part of the discussion and um, in particular the structure and the contents of uh, entries of these entries uh, across dictionaries so the hardware spelling variants and the roles of spelling variants uh, etymology as origin or derivation uh, if included but also source which is uh, usually uh, uh, geographical um, the presence of equivalence labels uh, if included definitions and encyclopedic contents and expansions uh, sometimes cross references or external reference to external sources uh, to botanists uh, of contemporary botanists or um, uh, botanists of the uh, previous centuries, British or, or uh, let's say European, uh, are included. Mm. Now, I have a very limited number of examples. Uh, you see the colors here, and these different colors is, um, I mean, this the use of these different colors is uh, necessary to uh, highlight uh, the different elements that uh, constitute, that structure the entry and uh, its contents. Um, green uh, usually. Uh, um, yeah, Green is used to highlight the geographical issues, black definition, um, blue uh, for equivalence and spelling variants, uh, purple uh, for um, uh, references, uh, brown uh, uh, for expansions, uh, encyclopedic expansion, and one in bold because uh, uh, these expansions refers to medical uh, usage. Um, these are two terms. I compare them on in James and Mother and Motherby because in Barrow and Hooper's they are not included. So uh, first, you can see uh, many similarities between James and Motherby. It is a lexicographic technique, uh, uh, the one that. Uh, the, takes. Uh, so compilers just used uh, what was published in previous dictionaries and then they reformulated or modified. This is the case. Uh, so they are very similar in the case of Abanga. Uh, introduced the search uh, uh, Abanga, uh, which is um, um, uh, I mean, a foreign word, uh, so uh, the, uh, the spelling and transliteration of those sounds, uh, the phonological, the way they um, they call uh, the fruit. Why um, are they interesting? And in particular, uh, uh, Madhubi's um, uh, entry, because uh, it's an example or of how the scientific discourse, scientific texts um, uh, uh, was going to be uh, structured. So here the focus is on doers and actors, on people doing something. Here uh, the um, uh, the um, uh, the focus is on the object, the name of the fruit is, or the tree is, the fruit is like. Uh, so again, what is not relevant is omitted. There's a, a strict selection of contents and the way they are displayed in these, um, I mean, as a lexicographic practice, but also as a scientific discourse in progress. So the construction of scientific text in that period, 30 years have passed between them. Uh, the same here, uh, the same colors, the same, let's say, ingredients. Uh, um, but, you know, uh, this is another uh, feature uh, which is relevant for example, in James, James tend to be a scholarly, uh, all-inclusive um, uh, kind of medical dictionary and uh, displaying uh, a certain uh, degree of uh, 
erudition. So um, many details, uh, um, many different names included uh, uh, in relation to different sources. So this mark both uh, the um, uh, characteristic of this particular uh, dictionary, but also the fact that we are uh, 30 years uh, um, uh, before the publication of Motherby, and so uh, probably, uh, mm, I mean, less defined, so um, it's, it's more fluid, mm, more fluid uh, kind of attitude uh, to these new plants and the names and the perspectives of these different botanists um, uh, that uh, that put forward uh, these um, uh, these names. Uh, more selective is Mother B. Mm. This Abel Marsh, Grand Marsh, Mask Marlow. That's, that's all. Um, so here instead, um, the um, comparison is between James and Barrow. Uh, in Motherby and Hooper, these two uh, words are not included. Uh, what happens between the three folio uh, volumes and uh, the single octavo uh, volume? Uh, I mm, told you before that Barrow, uh, Barrow's work list, Barrow's Lemata, just overlap James Lemata, and in particular for, uh, I mean, um, after letter A, so later letters uh, and and in particular towards the end of it, um, just uh, completely overlap. But Barrow just uh, introduces in this case uh, uh, some equivalents. So the casual castle tree, those that were used, uh, commonly used, Akajaiba. Uh, the same for Akaju. Um, or uh, the same. Mm. Abutelium, the name is Arabic yellow mallow, the Arabic name of the herb yellow mallow. So very, very concise and reformulated in a more focused uh, uh, way, at least for these first uh, pieces of information introduced by James. Mm. The same with uh, um, uh, Jambos. I go on, not present in Motherby and Cooper. Mm. So letter A is very, very expanded in James. So is, uh, um, I mean, uh, there are many terms that are not included in, uh, other, in, in, in the other dictionaries. This is an example. These are Abutilian, Jamakar and Jambus as uh, um, uh, in James' dictionary. You can see that they are very, very detailed uh, with many sources, external sources, and then uh, these arranged according to uh, uh, the different kinds of uh, Abutilian. Jamakar instead is very concise. Mm? And Jambus again organize uh, according to the differences between uh, this Prunus Malabarita or Jambus uh, prior, etc. So uh, the difference here. Now I skip to uh, letter H, just the first example. Uh, you can see that things have changed a lot. Uh, uh, um, very concise uh, in comparison uh, um, with the previous uh, um, uh, previous terminology uh, included in A. So uh, uh, space, uh, the number of pages and uh, the space in every uh, page is uh, uh, more limited. Um, here we have uh, um, the etymology Greek uh, from Greek, so uh, Hymer blood and Anthus flower, and uh, the correspondence in English blood flower, exactly as is calc, uh, or another name, and then again. Uh, the differences between these amanthus. Uh, Mother B and Barrow just reproduce, but in a, in a more concise way, what is present in James. What is relevant here is that the OED uh, gives uh, uh, the first record as uh, dated 1771, whereas we can come back. Uh, um, uh, 40 years because it is actually recorded in James. Mm. 
Um, now letter I again, uh, you can see how this ICACO or ICACO, uh, the American plan, um, is reduced. So um, we have a um, high number of equivalents uh, here. Uh, just mother bee is more selective, just the first one, and Barrow just gives it uh, as the equivalent. Uh, so um, no definition at all, again, reduction. And in this case as well, uh, the first evidence uh, in the OED 1752, but first evidence uh, as far as we know, um, uh, traces back to uh, James. Mm. Uh, again, this is instead uh, uh, the other, um, let's say, um, the reverse situation. Uh, Jalapa, um, just, I, I, I just included here the first, uh, uh, the first few lines. Uh, the entry covers uh, two and a half folio columns in length. It is not included in Mother in Mother B, but included in Barrow, uh, and with some more um, detail. It is interesting because actually these details are not included in uh, James, not uh, uh, at the very start of the um, uh, of the entry, but Hooper, which is. Uh, much more selective uh, in the inclusion of botanical terminology. It is more focused on medicine as such. Huh? Uh, includes this uh, in Latin with the uh, Jalab, the correspondence, the equivalent uh, in um, English, and with a long or longer uh, um, encyclopedic uh, uh, expansion with those relevant uh, medical issues in uh, bold. Now, uh, to conclude my um, my last example, and uh, so letter P, again, Hooper is empty. Uh, Paco Kartinga, why um, these Paco Kartinga? Uh, because ka is um, uh, means forest, uh, as this natural vegetation for forest, and Tupi is one of the uh, indigenous languages of South America that provided so many, uh, so many um, uh, terms, mm, botanical terms that were uh, mm, transcribed, transliterated, but entered and are included. As such, for example, in the OED, in the OED we have Kartinga forest. Here, yeah, first evidence, the first example provided by the OED is 1864, but we have this uh, uh, 120 years uh, uh, before in James, Motherby and uh, Barrow as well. So, is again, uh, medical issues, a reduction uh, in James, uh, um, more, con um, more concise um, entries, uh, further selection here, and just uh, here we have the definition and Brazilian cannabis um, uh, geographical, uh, geographical issue. So, uh, to conclude, which are the general features, lexicographic, uh, features, lexicographic components? Um, terms, these new terms are included in English or as English or anglicized Latin, Latinized or other languages. And in particular, uh, from Tupi uh, through Portuguese, but also from Tupi uh, through French or even Sanskrit for certain words, Portuguese uh, and, and also Abang, Abelmoj, Arabic, and it's not included, but I, I tell you this. Um, but, uh, most of them uh, come from uh, Portuguese. Mm. Uh, spelling variants are not so many. Uh, um, this is an example, above, 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 and then uh, just one of them uh, was established. Labels are seldom included. Actually, this is, 
in in universal dictionaries of arts and sciences uh, you have labels such as in botany in materia medica in pharmacy but they include so many branches of knowledge that they need to define here it is supposed that um, the readership is is uh, is clearly focused on that uh, domain uh, complex domain so including pharmacy including chemistry including botany so it is not necessary not perceived as necessary but something that overlaps between i mean it's kind of overlapping between mm, labels or introductory expressions and uh, glosses and definition is the name of the fruit so we know that's a fruit a tree egyptian plant or the seed of a plant so just creating the context the general context Etymology is included as original derivation, for example, from Greek, or geographical area, the source. Of. So we have expressions such as the inhabitants of, um, included, not always, but when included as source and uh, original derivation, geographical areas, uh, the inhabitants of, called there, or the Arabic name of, or from and Brazilianses, Brazilianses, uh, etc., or grows in Peru's, Indians. And, and so on. Um, whereas English anglicized or uh, Latin Latinized uh, equivalents are introduced by expressions such as scholars, uh, calls this tree and then Latin or the tree is um, in Latin and then scholar as the source or lyca and then core vocabulary so English or a sort of and Latin and English uh, that can be found there so this is the structure um, so examples of this kind are uh, taken uh, from Abanga and Abel Marsh I mean the structures definition is present usually at the very start of the um, of the entry as the first element uh, but it may also relate like, with equivalents. So equivalents are used to define, to 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 provide, uh, uh, to balance these um, uh, difficult uh, technical uh, new uh, new denomination. Um, and there are blurring boundaries uh, between translation and explanatory equivalents, and so blurring boundaries between equivalence and uh, something which seems to be uh, uh, a definition. So we have, for example, a shrub, bearing flower, these three grows to the size of a botanical term, etc. And then encyclopedic expansion is always present. We are dealing with the, is the dictionary um, of medicine, so uh, reference is very concrete and external. It's not just the word, but practices, the practice uses, etc. An extension varies uh, from a few lines uh, to um, two, three folio columns. This is the case with Abutilan, Akaju, Jalapa, Jambus, and cross references, so within the text. Uh, so you have C, it has which C or nothing, or external reference, you mean external uh, sources. To conclude, except uh, as, as regards this full dictionary, except for A, a more strict correspondence in the word list clearly emerge uh, for the letters, uh, so mid, uh, middle way, H, I, J and P, plus James, Motherby and Barrow, so they are strictly related, um, even though the size and the general aims are different. Uh, the correspondence between James and Barry is particularly relevant due to the different size of their works and their aims and their intention and their practice as well. And the similarity um, highlights both the backbone of botanical terminology that is established and so just uh, uh, taking uh, words from Seeding dictionaries just establishes the matter from a lexicographic viewpoint, but also from a, a botanical uh, viewpoint. And this is fundamental. So uh, there are uh, botanical, recurrent botanical word list. Hmm? Uber's dictionary stands out as a different one since uh, it, it is more similar, um, more similar to a handbook, a textbook uh, uh, for students or semi-expert, is more selective than previous dictionaries 
And uh, as regards the OED, inclusion and timeline, some words are included in the OED exactly as they are found in James. So the original form, this, um, um, I mean, um, as, as in the past, um, as they arrived uh, in English, um, and evidence as recorded in the OED, sometimes later than evidence in 18th century medical uh, dictionary. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Just, uh, oops. No. That's. Okay. Thank, thank you, you for your for your talk. A different perspective. Uh, the typographical one. Uh, well, particularly interesting for me. What uh, what um, was particularly relevant? Uh, uh, I mean, by comparison with previous talks, uh, was the uh, role of these. Uh, words, botanical terms from outside Europe, from uh, elsewhere, uh, which uh, brings uh, into question problems of um, uh, not, not, not just colonization, but, but also uh, economic problems, okay? So, um, exploitation of, of nature in, in object description. Uh, anyway, uh, we, we, we are perfectly on time. Uh, we, we have time for questions and comments in English or in, in Italian, in Italiano. Se avete qualche commento, qualche domanda da fare su queste relazioni, appunto ripeto, o, o in inglese o in italiano, ce la caviamo poi con Justin. La risolviamo in qualche modo. Sì, non vedo la mano. Uh, vediamo un po'. Non importa, eh, ecco, ecco, bene, bene, professoressa, prego, prego, prego. Eh, grazie, eh, io ringrazio molto i relatori che hanno parlato questa mattina perché eh, hanno mostrato come eh, storicamente vada affrontato il problema, e, non solo dei boschi, di cui si è parlato poco, ma in generale del, delle scienze naturali, che vanno proprio, sono proprio delle scienze storiche, e sia dal punto di vista delle piante, sia dal punto di vista del modo di studiarle. E in particolare volevo chiedere a um, Andrea um, se uh, nel suo... Nella sua ricerca ha trovato, oltre che eh, semplici nomi di cui ha fatto cenno, to provide names, ha trovato anche il tentativo di fare ordine, cioè di ordinare le piante secondo dei gruppi. Ehm, e, eh, è interessante come abbia mostrato la difficoltà di accordi, di, di dare nomi che perdura, perdura oggi e che eh, è uno dei problemi della, della botanica, quello di eh, nei nomi o dare lo stesso nome a specie diverse, eh, in particolare allora. E quindi eh, il, se mi chiedo se il primo tentativo sia stato quello semplicemente di dare tentare di nominare delle piante, siamo poi prima di Linneo quando lei ha parlato, oppure ci sia stato anche il tentativo di dare un ordine eh, che le raggruppasse in qualche modo. E poi ho altre domande, ma vorrei iniziare a dare la parola a lei. Vado. Prego. Grazie, per la, grazie per la domanda che mi permette di approfondire un aspetto eh, che ho potuto toccare solo tangenzialmente nella relazione che è proprio quella dell'ordine della classificazione all'interno di, eh, di queste compilazioni. Um, sì, c'è un tentativo con il primo um, naturalista che ho toccato, William Turner, abbiamo un ordine all'inizio. Uh, che, che sembra un pochino sottolineare il fatto che la sua il, um, preoccupazione principale di Turner è quella di um, è relativa ai nomi, cioè vuole trasferire questo bagaglio di conoscenze classiche in campo naturalista e di osservazione del mondo naturale, del mondo vegetale, dal, dalle lingue classiche greco-latino 
oppure francese, attraverso le traduzioni francesi, eccetera, in inglese. Quindi quella sembra essere la sua prima preoccupazione. E infatti esatto, la esatto. Che si muove a cavallo fra la, uh, la lessicografia e la botanica, entrambe anche l'itera, fra l'altro. Quindi siamo ancora agli albori di entrambe le discipline, ed è interessante. Eh, Invece con i naturalisti che seguono Turner, inizia a svilupparsi il, o meglio, um, Uh, recepiscono gli influssi degli sviluppi delle scienze naturalistiche continentali e adottano sistemi di classificazione. Alcune in realtà derivate dai classici, Teofrasco, per esempio Gerard, ha una, ha una classificazione nelle, in quelle che io ho imparato a essere le quattro, i quattro gruppi tradizionali, degli, arv, frutex, sufrutex, e, aspetti eh, che lo recupero, Uh, quelli di Teofrasco, insomma, adesso non... Uh... Grazie, forse. Ecco, invece poi no. con i botanici, no, non, proprio botanici, naturalisti del, del periodo successivo, della prima metà del Seicento che, che abbiamo visto, um, sviluppano dei sistemi che io non ho saputo identificare. Forse c'è un pochino di influenza di Cesalpino, però non lo so, questo potrebbero dirlo meglio i botanici, gli studiosi di botanica e forse sono tentativi loro di sviluppare un sistema che si avvicina a essere un sistema naturale, quindi cercare di capire le piante eh, come esseri in, in relazione gli uni con gli altri e non con un sistema artificiale necessariamente, um, o, o forse un, un misto fra, fra una classificazione che tende a essere naturale e una classificazione che, che è artificiale, un misto fra queste due cose. E... Sì, poi quello che prevarrà è il sistema artificiale di Linneo, comunque, prima di parlare di sistema naturale deve passare ancora molto tempo. Ehm, avrei una domanda anche per eh, Justin Bagley. Eh, Uh, as you said, uh, uh, your uh, very interesting speech showed us the importance of historical methodology in, um, in, the, in the studying uh, botanist. And uh, it shows also, at least um, as, as far as I understood, Uh, how difficult it was even to separate animals from uh, plants, which is still a, a problem. And, um, uh, and also it shows, uh, as far as I understood, uh, how it was uh, um, uh, difficult to uh, separate um, uh, exact um, sciences as Newtonian sciences, physics. Um, you talked about me number, measure and weight, and which are not uh, typical of um, organism studies, but of physics and uh, sciences, universe, which uh, looks and has the aim of stating universal laws, which is not the aim of um, natural, of uh, living um, organism, is not, it's, it's the world of uh, um, living organism is much more complicated and it's much more difficult to uh, um, state uh, uh, laws and it was very interesting how you you uh, showed it and um, you also showed uh, how the study and uh, also uh, Andreani showed how the study was on plants, single plants and not on woods, I mean not necessarily woods, but not on vegetal formation, aggregations, but just on one single plant, which is also the method, the Linnean methodology. It just comes after, and I, I think I will speak about, my speech will be about that, that the uh, scientists uh, were able to state 
the idea of formation of plants. Also, uh, in the uh, speech of uh, uh, Professor Lonati, uh, at, the at the very beginning, she uh, was shown how wood means trees, uh, just one kind of plant together more than one, but one kind of plants. And this is very interesting because meanwhile, in the economic and the commercial world, the idea of wood was already very developed. So I, I'm asking to myself if you were, if you have a sort of uh, possibility to show us these two different words, the scientific one with the single plants and the commercial and economic ones with already the idea of a wood. Thank you. Non sento niente. Non okay. sento Grazie, grazie per queste domande. Vediamo i relatori cosa vogliono rispondere. Justin, will you comment on what you heard, please? Um, yes, I think, thank you very much, uh, Grazie, thank you very much for this um, question. Um, I, I agree completely. I think it was becoming increasingly um, difficult at this period in time to differentiate clearly um, plants from animals. And I think some of the reason for this was precisely because of what was being discussed, this discovery of new species of plants in the new world. So one instance would be the Mimosa Pudica, um, for example, this extremely sensitive plant that on the touch it curls up its um, leaves. And obviously within the traditional sort of Aristotelian notion of the soul, you have humans with rational souls, you have animals with sensitive souls, and then you have vegetables with these nutritive growth um, souls. And because you found these uh, specimens that were particularly sensitive, almost like almost seeming to behave like animals with their um, rapid motions, this actually further um, narrowed the distinction between plants and animals um, in a way that allowed for even more fruitful comparisons in discussions of plants and animals. So that's maybe an attempt to draw together the question of both um, yeah, discoveries in the new world and also the relationship between plants and animals and the increasingly close relationship between them. Okay, 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 thank you. Uh, Elisabetta, hai alzato la mano? Uh, Microfono, microfono, microfono. No. No. Il microfono, il microfono, il microfono, okay. Okay, il microfono. Sì, sì, okay. um, per, rispond allora, uh, per rispondere uh, o, o comunque un, un, un commento uh, a breve, allora eh, i dizionari commerciali, eh, ci sono due dizionari commerciali che vengono pubblicati eh, a metà del Settecento, uno è quello di Rolt da cui ho tratto quello Sub Edward, eh, cioè eh, Wood, eh, e che include sia il termine Wood sia Forest. Eh. L'altro dizionario commerciale che è quello di Post of Weight, eh, Dictionaries of Trade and Commerce, che è una traduzione da un dizionario francese del 1723, quello di Savarie, che viene riadattato in inglese, non contiene né wood né forest. So, uh, questa è la, la prima cosa. Uh, L'altra uh, non ci sono, allora quelle di Rolt uh, sono comunque delle uh, entrate uh, piuttosto brevi, uh, di tipo descrittivo rispettivamente a quello che viene inteso come forest, con qualche riferimento per esempio alle, eh, alle leggi che regolano eh, l'utilizzo della, della forest in UK eh? um, e um, invece in wood eh, appunto ancora di tipo descrittivo ma senza particolari riferimenti allo sfruttamento commerciale. Quello che invece compare spot e parte del progetto eh, mio è proprio questo, cioè 
oggi non c'era tempo, ma è, è, è la, la ricerca di alcuni termini che sono inclusi sia nei termini botanici, sia eh, nel, eh, nei dizionari medici, sia nei dizionari universali, quindi essenzialmente Chambers, Las, Glenn, Rees e l'enciclopedia britannica, Uh, e poi dizionari commerciali di Rolt e Postle, co cosa dicono, cioè quale prospettiva hanno su alcune piante e eh, termini eh, a livello di sfruttamento commerciale. Questo succede soprattutto per i legni eh, profumati, per i legni particolari, per le spezie oppure quelle piante che servono per le tinture, per esempio. Mm. E a questo proposito io ho lavorato sui dizionari commerciali relativamente alla rappresentazione delle nuove aree geografiche eh, come terra di conquista coloniale. Allora, queste aree geografiche, in particolare le Americhe eh, e l'Africa, eh, e con, con delle parziali differenze il lontano Oriente, allora queste, ehm, questi nuovi paesi, cioè questi paesi colonizzati e sfruttati a livello commerciale sono rappresentati dalle loro ricchezze naturali e dal nome eh, di piante eh, o di sostanze appunto naturali eh, che ne costituiscono la ricchezza. Quindi questo è un, 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 un dato forte. L'altra cosa invece che, che volevo dire che mi è venuta in mente appunto quando prima parlavate di uh, sistema artificiale o naturale di classificazione, cioè quindi la miriade di proposte che ci sono uh, nel periodo, l'enciclopedia britannica che ha uh, come uno dei suoi obiettivi quello di, uh, di, di, mh, proprio di, di sostenere, insomma, di, di dare peso uh, al, a ciò che è British, uh -huh. um, nel suo trattato botanica, ne include 44 dei trattati, uh, si fa essenzialmente una riduzione uh, solo del sistema di Linneo. Quindi eh, questo è significativo, è significativo nel senso che non viene fatto riferimento, non viene preso come, come dire, eh, quello che è avvenuto, quello che è stato studiato, proposto da eh, botanici eh, inglesi, eh, ma eh, viene preso completamente appunto il sistema, il dibattito sul sistema di Linneo. Ecco, questo, questo, non so se ho risposto o se ecco, rispetto a quanto ho chiesto. Sì, sì. Grazie. 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 C'è qualche altra domanda o commento da fare? Yes, I have one. My eye. Okay. Uh, Justin, uh, Justin. Um, thank you for your um, presentation. I would like to know uh, if um, um, in these uh, books, in these treatises, Uh, there are some, um, some uh, illustration representing the tree of knowledge. So if you associate animal and the natural world, I mean, as plants, so is there anything that just represents uh, graphically uh, these branches as connected? Um, unfortunately not. Uh, obviously they both would have been, um, so they were both trained in Cambridge and they would have been aware of the porphyry and tree and the branching of the disciplines and these sort of things, but they, they don't actually represent that um, mm -hmm. themselves. Um, Gru's, um, rep Gru's images are mostly um, ones that he took using his microscope to go very close into mm -hmm. the plant to try to see its external functions so that he could try to figure out a way okay do these map onto animal functions do they not map onto animal functions and Hale's uh, representations are usually ones where he is um, trying to show how he's doing his experiments so those are they're more particular um representations rather than general ones about the nature okay. of knowledge or discipline okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Prego, Angela. Uh, vado con una domanda per Elisabetta. So I'll, I'll, I'll ask in English. So uh, okay. uh, if, if you have any ideas why 
um, there are so many anti-dating in the OED. Is that because the OED did not consider those compilations uh, within its sources? Have you have you had the time to? Um, no, uh, I mean, uh, I don't really know. Mm, um, and um, what uh, what I know in, in general when uh, checking uh, the OED uh, for uh, lexicographic work, um, uh, works of the past, not only um, uh, medical dictionaries, but also universal dictionaries of arts and sciences, uh, just the, the, the examples, the extracts taken from these lexicographic works of the past are scanty. Uh, just the, the few examples taken from these uh, uh, these kind of works, these reference works, usually taken from other kinds of of uh, production. So it's um, yesterday I checked again uh, 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 to be certain that mm, mm, I mean of that, and actually they are uh, they are just not considered as regards yeah. this this uh, it's this kind of, that should be yeah. natural <laughs> should be. But anyway, thank you. Thank you. Bene, allora non so cosa, cosa ne pensate, cosa pensa Alessandra che è il nostro grande capo, se vogliamo conquistarci un otto minuti di pausa per un caffè e, e ci rivediamo alle 11, può andare bene Alessandra? Certamente sì, perfetto, eh, alle allora, 11 sì, allora, abbiamo praticamente 5 minuti. Alle 11, punto in punto, Adesso. riprendiamo. Ci diamo qualche minuto allora. D'accordo. Okay. Tra poco. Grazie. So, see you at 11. Sharp. Ok. Ok.